Simon, thank you very much for joining me, first of all. It's a very long journey to get here. <laughs> yep. Folks, we have been um, Zoom failed on us. Long story short, there was a problem with the audio with Zoom, so we had to download Skype. And uh, I'm on my girl, my my girlfriend, my wife's uh, laptop, so I had to get all sorts of permissions and stupid passwords from that. So we're we're on Skype and it's working so far. Because uh, my um, my my main computer's like um, a desktop, so it doesn't have like a webcam or anything. Right. So uh, okay. for this kind of stuff, yeah, I have to use a uh, quite an outdated tablet. So uh, yeah. Branching the technologies. But yeah, it's crazy. Well, technology. You said you, <laughs> you said you're a Luddite. Is that true or is that an exaggeration? Um uh, grossly exaggerated, I'm sure. Kind of yes and kind of no, like um Technology is okay, but so, so sometimes it can slow you down and it makes things too complicated. And I kind of have um, a short attention span. If I if I can't nail it in a short amount of time, I'll just um, you know, it's not for me. You know. And, yeah, I know that. I know that. <clears throat> and you know, this uh, you can probably see this old house I'm living in. I'm I'm kind of restoring it, mm -hmm. and. When they built these houses, it, it's mud and stone. There's yeah. no cement, and you know I'm sitting on the third floor, so you know they're kind of quite quite substantial walls. And where I'm restoring it, I, I'm I'm using the same. I'm using mud and straw, because that's kind of how they built it, and it's been here for long enough not yeah. to need that and concrete. So yeah, a lot in some respects, yeah. <laughs> How old is the house? Um, it's hard to say. Like, pro probably um, working it out like um, turn of the nineteenth century or something. That old, give or, take, give or take, give or take. Yeah. The guy, the guy I bought it off, it was his great great uncle had built it or something. Mm -hmm. It's like. I think in this whole valley, there's like three families that live here that have lived here forever. They, they, they even have found Wikipedia pages about these uh, oh, families. Oh, really? But yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, the nobility of Ariash? Or... Yeah, well, you know, they're okay with me. Yeah, that's good. Um, how long have you been living in France then? Um, since. 2012, um, kind of um, Easter 2012. Okay, interesting. My first time back to England was um, for two months, the summer, just gone. The first okay. time in, uh, yeah, long time. The first time in, in those eight years then, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Who chased you out of England then? And what did you do? <laughs> uh, oh, man. That is, that is, is it, if, if Hunter S. Thompson wrote it, you'd probably think that he was making it up. Um, really? It's one of those stories. <laughs> Chasing a French lover who lived around the corner from me in Brighton, and we ended up doing a road trip down to her barn she had just bought in France. Mm -hmm. And then, um, for another reason, I was faced with a choice of go back to England and go into that reality or stay here and dig a vegetable patch with um, in my rucksack. And uh, yeah, and that's kind of what I did actually. So it's a bit of a. They made the right, right. You made the right choice. I mean, dreary, dreary Great Britain compared to the lovely countryside, seemingly lovely of what I've seen of it. And. Um, I'm familiar enough with uh, the south of France the, and more the, the Loire Valley region. Um, I've been to Paris as well and done all that nonsense too, but 
Um, the, so the southern regions are just unspeakable beauty, and uh, you know it's unbelievable. Well, so. there, there is, in the, there is in the United Kingdom as well. If if you, oh yeah, yeah, there is. But hard, harder, and you know, it's just harder so. to get the weather, isn't it? It's just the weather, you know. And uh, and that one of one of the um, the sort of truths of the story also is like since, since I was like um, quite young. I, I did a lot of traveling in England on on the what you'd say the new age traveler kind of thing and you know, stuff dreadlocks and did all that kind of thing in the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you're always traveling, you you know, and, and you're young, you, you never you're not really putting down roots anywhere. Yeah. And one of the few places I ever felt at home was um, up in the Highlands of Scotland, and every mm. time I. The Highlands of Scotland. There was this like deep feeling of um, arriving home, or um, yeah, you know, something, some, something inexplicable, you know, from, from you know, from the soul mm. of the heart. Did you have any? And when I arrived here in France, it was exactly the same, exactly the same feeling right. after right. travelling for like twenty odd years, probably mm. pretty much you know, arriving somewhere where it's like, oh man, it's like coming home again. You know? Yeah, that's right. cool. Do you have any Scottish or French blood that you know of? Um, no, not at all. My um, father's family are from um, Yorkshire and Lancashire, respectively, my grandparents. And my mother's family are um, kind of East End vaudeville entertainers. They were like tap dancers and clowns and things in the uh, sort of uh, variety hall kind of... Uh, days of you know like wartime stuff i guess yeah so that's really cool. interesting that's cool <laughs> yeah, it makes you, interest <laughs> it's good to have a, a good, you come from a good mixture of stock then okay so what what are you smoking at the moment what uh, pipe and what blend I kind of changed my mind what I was going to smoke. I, I was going to smoke some Rat Trace Marlin Flake. Mm -hmm. I was going to smoke it in this really nice um, George Jensen pipe. It's lovely. You know, if you get, get the curves, the light. But yeah, it's, it's a lovely pipe. Lovely light. But I, I, I rubbed out a bit too much. And I, I thought I'll have a little smoke of it in my little bulldog beforehand. And okay. then I thought, oh, no. I, I changed my mind. And I ended up um, lighting up, um, what is it actually, a Robert Lewis Oriental mixture. Okay, completely different then. <laughs> yeah, again, in, in um, a George Jensen pipe, I kind of, I don't know, is that a, a love it where you have the big... Yeah, some sort of Canadian, it's a love it. Yeah, is it love it? It has an oval shank, so does that make it... Uh... I think the Lovets have oval shanks, don't they? Or do they? I, if I understand Asian crown song and a Lovets like oval with a saddle. Saddle bit, yeah, yeah. I didn't swear to it, you know. <laughs> I think you're right. It's nice, very nice pipe. So Orientals then, something I'm not very, very fond of, but each to their own. Um, let me see next. Oh, oh. I find an Oriental though that doesn't have Latakia in it, I found. And the one that I, I like, and I have sent a few samples out, is the Sam Highland balls I did a video of, where you actually get these little wrapped balls of tobacco and lots of Oriental leaf and uh, yeah. some um, broken flake. Yeah. And there's no Latakia in that. And the, the Orientals are, are a different thing then, you know. Mm -hmm. I I've think finding uh, the ones with Latakia. Um, you know. Sean Victorian Piper was talking about those those balls. Bear with me. Uh, yeah, Sean. Do you know Sean Victorian Piper? I do. Yeah, yeah. He lives um, very close to where I was staying in the summer, actually, in England. Right. Very close. <laughs> I think he had his hands on some Highland balls. He was telling me about it, and uh, he managed to get them from a a very small store in the south of Germany or something. So they're like, isn't it yeah, like, it's, just... you, it's like you can choose how much of the tobacco you want. You can tear off like a, the wrapper, more of the wrapper. And... 
Yeah, I mean, and the rest of the filler is like sort of a, a broken flake, Virginia Burley. I mm -hmm. just, 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 just. And then, yeah, it's, it's kind of quite cool if, if you've got a, a nice um, big diameter bowl. You don't mm -hmm. even have to tear the leaf up. Actually, you know, you can just sort of stuff it in, and it's 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 a different thing. It, it's Lovely. really nice, actually. Very nice. I'll have to try some of that. Let's see. Um, yeah. Do you, do you have a favorite pipe or a favorite style of pipe? What's your favorite? I think my tastes have changed. Um, so I've only been smoking a pipe for, for maybe two years or so. Uh -huh. And initially, um, I was drawn to all, all the uh, like Danish freehands, like some of the Nordings, you know, the, these very um, you know, sculpted sort of uh, freehand pipes. And uh, yeah, I've, I've got a couple of them. And I, whereas now, actually, now I've, I've really got an eye for the classics, like the billiards and the, yeah. you know, and I, and partly, if I'm honest, it's, it's that feeling of, of self, it's, if you're out smoking your pipe and driving or, or walking around, smoking a pipe, sometimes I feel quite self-conscious. If, if I've got a, like a weird gandalfy free hand <laughs> on top of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see what you mean. Absolutely, I'm the same. I don't own one yet. I, I, I've had, uh, yeah, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong at all. I've uh, I haven't got a, a, a Danish style pipe in my collection yet, but uh, I probably will at some point. I like. I mean, some they, of they, 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 I've got one at hand. I think I have one at hand. Actually. They smoke fantastically, and I, I kind of have a theory for it because they're very um, deep bowls. Mm -hmm. But at the top, at the top, um, you know, the, you have the plateau, so it's it's, it's it's very wide at the top. Yeah, and it tapers down, kind of thing. And so, when you first light the fire, there's a lot of insulation there of the wood to get the fire going. You know, to get the tobacco burning. Mm -hmm. And as as it, as it shallows out as, and it starts to get a bit hotter, there's less insulation. So it's hotter to the hand, but that kind of means that the ember is losing the, the heat. Isn't you know it's losing, it's, it's um leaving the chamber, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that but, makes uh, sense. Yeah, that, kind of. Yeah. Kind of. I thought about it. An, an engineering point of view. Yeah, I can see that. I'll definitely have to try one. Yeah, I'd like and it to funnel. Um, it's the same smoking these bulldogs, because I don't know, you probably can't even see that, but you get uh, the very V shaped on the front, and the yeah. chamber's the same. So it's just, you end up with nothing in the bottom, you know, and as, yeah. as, as the pole gets hotter, it gets, you know, the, the chamber gets reduced. Proportionately, the walls get thinner, and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh... yeah, yeah you've got I... engineering you don't think about, isn't there? Really, yeah. My best smoking pipe is a, a limited edition old school hard castle from the late 70s or early 80s, and it's, it's the same, it has the, the diamond shank with the V cut, so it's the bowl tapers down like that. That's probably why it's the best smoking. So yeah, good point. Good point indeed. I think, you know, Excuse most of my pipe, the pipes that I enjoy smoking, and I have pipes here that I've had one or two of them, and you know that at one point I had a really nice uh, Savonelli Punto Oro with a gold mount bent billiard. Yeah, and it smoked okay, and I was like, well, yeah, but. I didn't fall in love with it, you know. It didn't replace anything that I had, and it was like, okay, yeah, it's a Savonelli Panto all over the silver mount, and I'm like, actually, I, I I think I'd rather pass it on to somebody that's really going to enjoy smoking Savonelli Panto all over the silver mount because. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, there's two there's two schools of smokers, you know, the the uh, the people who chase the you know the like the Dunhill White Spot for example or the uh Punto Oro. Oh, I, I, I love that. You know, but... Yeah. I like all pipes as long as they smoke well. So I'm really... a fan of uh, George Jensen pipes and uh I mean, I, actually, I probably only have about 12 or 15 pipes or something. That my pipes. Mm -hmm. It's a bit scary. And I have one, two, three. Yeah, three George Jensen's out of all of them. And I don't know. I, I kind of find it strange that in, in the world of pipe tobacco, you know, George Jensen, you know, he, he's kind of a legend. Mm -hmm. But in the world of pipes, not, you know, Savinelli and, and, and Peterson's and George, and they're, and they're dirt cheap. I mean, th this is a beautiful piece of briar with a vulcanite stem. And uh, some of the stampings, it's um, you can work out whether it's just a factory piece, whether mm -hmm. it's a handmade piece. And then the specials, you know, and even the specials, you know, I think I paid about 30 euros for this. Really? It weighs nothing. It's a big pipe with a big bowl, and it's, it weighs nothing. And George Jensen pipes. This this one was a blurred photograph on um, French eBay. Mm -hmm. I think I paid um, six euros. Jesus, really? But I've just given this a new um, shellac coat. I got some shellac the other day, so I've been experimenting, uh, diluting shellac flakes. So this, uh, my first shellac coating, so I'm going I'm to see how that uh, behaves what, compared to what is um, what is shellac? I've never heard of shellac. Um, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure what it is in origin, but what it is in reality is like um, like flakes, but mm -hmm. like laundry flakes, like like snowflakes, yeah. and it's it's kind of like it's a wax like carnival wax yeah yeah okay it's a bit different okay and you um, kind of dissolve it in alcohol dissolve it in alcohol and you kind of make um depending how much alcohol you use it's either just like a, a, a something to seal the wood or you can do a really deep heavy, heavy gloss varnish right. at the same time depending on on the you know, alcohol dilutions. Yeah. So, yeah, I got, I got a bag of this and uh, mixed it up with some alcohol. Nice. But, the caribou, but, yeah. but wax have come, came in flakes, so I have to... I don't know what the hell you're meant to do with the flakes. I'm going to melt it down into a block. I, I, have... I, put, it, I put it in... Um, probably in the oven at a low temperature because it, it, it's quite hard to melt. It's like plastic, this stuff. Yeah. The first time I tried it was with like just a real slow, like cordless drill, buffing wheel, and it, it just mm -hmm. doesn't pick up our evil wax. It's not going fast enough to get the yeah, um, yeah. heat friction, you know. Yeah. And yeah, I, funny I tried Dremel. It doesn't work with a Dremel either. But I, uh, I recently I'm waiting on a. I have a table grinder coming with a buffing wheel, so. I'll melt the Karanuba into a bar and, and use it on the buffing wheel. Looking forward to that. Buy one. <laughs> Man, you can get really good ones on Amazon. Seem to have really good reviews and they're under well under a hundred pounds. I've, I've kind of been using one and I, I think it sparked and stopped working yesterday. Um, I've had right. to change the brushes on the motor already and I hope oh, really? I'm ready to get it going. And I'm like, oh man, and and it spins a bit too fast to be honest. Now I know a bit more what I'm doing after, you know, using it for a while. Yeah. And I can, if I have to replace it for about a hundred euros, you can get like um, a pillar drill, you know. Right. And they have um, controllable speed, so you, you can get the slow speeds and stuff. And oh. you can just put the buffing wheel on 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 the um, drill. Also, you just have to work. Buffing wheel um, going horizontally. Yeah. And then, of course, it means you can maybe um, drill chambers or be. Yeah. It's another, isn't it? You know? 
kind of the same price. Yeah. Getting closer and closer every day to buying a lathe, isn't that what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that, that's kind of um, something I'd love to do is actually make some pipes. Um, I used to make lots of really intricate coconut jewellery out of coconut shells. Mm. And I'm all right with my hands and stuff, and I've always been a bit of, um, how do you say, uh, a tinkerer. Tinkerer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But for sure, but I think, yeah, you know, the best way to learn how to make pipes is to start restoring the state pipes, possibly. Yeah, yeah. You know, polishing, I think, oh, that's really easy. And then, oh, you dig the buffing wheel in, you mm-hmm. just burn the fryer. And, well, it doesn't really matter on, on, on the cheap pipe. But if that was something that you just spent a few days yeah. creating. And then the, I'm kind of doing it from the other way up kind of thing you know doing some stem restorations and uh, getting the feel for the different materials and yeah. and uh, yeah for sure i'd love to i'd love to um make pipes <laughs> yeah take you try your hand at them yeah you seem to be doing uh i mean you seem to be good with your hands you've been making a i saw a couple of your different videos uh you've been cav- making your own cavendish you've been stoving you've been uh you've made your own rope slash plug tobacco and the parik you had with a car jack you were using a, a was it a car jack to cre- recreate the pressure to make, what was it yeah that was brilliant is it still is it still fermenting still bubbling away the, 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 excuse me there's a bit of a story of the parik and mm-hmm. um, because i went to england um the first time for a couple of months for a bit of work mm-hmm. i uh, Kind of dismantled everything and not in a rush, but you know, not in a calculate. And I remember not putting the bag of dried perique in my wardrobe of claves with my other tobaccos because it stunk. And I can't find it. It's, 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 um, <laughs> seriously, is it gone? Really? <laughs> but I've I've i done a couple of test makes in the last couple of days of the of the um, roly ropey ones. Yeah, yeah. And actually, yeah, it's okay. You know, it's not okay compared to what you're going to buy in a tin for loads of money. Okay, but seeing as it's only like was made last springtime with some low grade leaf I bought off the internet from Germany, which yeah. really, you know, it's really eat this stuff it's about 14 14 euros a kilo yeah yeah guys we're talking about uh simon made his own uh plug log it's basically a long it was a load of kentucky leaves in the middle wasn't it and then a bit of burley and virgin maybe some virginias on the outside what was Uh, it yeah yeah there's a few different it was a very interesting way of uh it was a food grade bit of burlap, like almost like a burlap sack. And then you had them tightened up with, where did you get that method with the string? Like, I think, I think it's cool that there, there was, um, before I discovered the, 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 uh, YTPC, I kind of, um, spent a lot of time lurking on, um, online forums of people who grew their own tobacco leaves and things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, one of the conversations was about Perique, which is understood to be, uh, you know, fermented tobacco. Yeah. Um, but obviously, they didn't ferment a tub of tobacco and decide to call it Perique. You know, the name took many generations to, to fix. Mm-hmm. Um, another tobacco called Perique, um, it was called uh, a naval Perique. And the mm-hmm. uh, the sailors would buy whole leaf tobacco and they would use this technique with um, like wax sailcloth yeah and they'd hang it up in the boat yeah and and preserve their tobacco um and there's a there's a video on youtube of this old guy and you know he's pretty old like late 80s um and lots of people with beards and pipes and uh and tankards of real ale in the garden Mm -hmm. and he was showing them how they how they did this and it took two people um you know ropes and you know all kind of uh nautical 
but yeah, it was fascinating to watch it. And I was like, well, you know, that's one way of doing it. Um, so I'd, I'd already built a press, but the press was too strong for the press and it kind of um, exploded. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I try, uh, try a different angle. <laughs> yeah, it seems you can get a lot more, a lot more tobacco pressed using your method than, say, a noodle press. That you know, most people are using a noodle press to do that sort of thing at home. But this is, seems a very efficient way if you have a lot of leaves or a lot of blends you want to mix. Or I, I, I think, I think probably the big difference is a noodle press. If you really like, um, say, full Virginia flake, but you might want to press it with a bit of um, HH Burley or something like this, mm -hmm. the needle press is, is, you know, in those quantities is going to be the thing. But yeah, yeah. You know, if you buy the whole leaves from Germany, they're about like, I don't know, 14 euros a kilo. So Serious? for less than 100. Yeah, for less than a hundred euros, you end up with like seven or eight kilos of, um, you know, there's there's a few Burleys, a few Virginias, and it's pretty low grade leaf, probably, and you know, it's it's not like um, probably off to the Benson and Hedges factory, but um, just for experimenting with at home, you know, it's like a, I mean, it's kind of why I started smoking a pipe was this whole leaf tobacco journey, actually. Right. Okay. Uh, work for me. Um, not. It's about a two-hour drive from here. There's, um, I guess, technically, it's a principality called uh, Andorra, mm -hmm. um, and it's a bit of a strange one. It, it is, it's, you know, it is its own country. It has its own police force. It has its own laws, but. Half of it is kind of administered by France, and the other half is kind of administered by Spain. Um, and it's a tax-free haven. Oh, really? It's a two-hour drive, but when you get there, like the you know a liter of diesel is like uh, maybe ninety cents instead of one euro fifty. Jesus, so it's worth the drive, and you fill up, and you know, like uh, a liter a liter of Grant's whiskey is like maybe five euros. Jesus. And there's some, um, you know, obviously tobacco is very cheap. Yeah. And in those days, I was smoking, um, I wasn't smoking a pipe. I, I discovered these, um, uh, trying to translate from one language to another. You know, these tubey things where, you, you know, you put your own tobacco into a tube of a machine. Yeah, yeah, the cigarette maker, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and they put the prices up one day in Andorra, and I'm like, well, I'm disgusted. My, you know, my usual, my usual, um, you know, five kilogram bucket of tobacco, the price has gone up. So I tried to buy. Uh, I went for a cheaper option. You right. kind of get back home and smoke it, and yeah, there's, there's, there'd been some mistake somewhere. You, you couldn't smoke this stuff. It, it, um, you, you die of ammonia poisoning. It, 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 something wrong with it. It was seriously. Um, yeah, I put some in the oven. I read on the internet, oh, if you put it in the oven at a gentle heat, you can um, improve, improve right. the quality. Right. I tried that. I opened the oven door and, and, and nearly, um, you know, nearly asphyxiated myself with the, with the ammonia coming ah. off this tobacco. It was like, yeah, I'm not exaggerating. It was toxic. You, you can yeah. smoke this yeah. shit. And I'm like, fuck, you know, I've, I've got like a month until I'm going to go again and I, I can't smoke this, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. So I looked on the internet and I, I found, all oh, right, yeah, you, you can buy these um, gold, these um, orange Virginia leaves, it was, and, and they were really cheap because it's um, an agricultural product. It's okay. just a leaf in touch, so there's no tax. So I thought, oh, I'll give it a go, you know, and it turned up. I opened the package, and the first thing that I opened was like, um, well, it wasn't the tin note, it was, it was like the bin liner note. It was like this incredible smell of the deepest, orangest, most intoxicating Virginia smell you've ever smelt in your life. Beautiful. And I was like, oh, man, that's, that, that, that's beautiful, you know? Yeah. And then kind of progressed to that, and then and I thought, well, you know, I wonder what, what this is like in a pipe. Yeah. And got a pipe, 
and learned the hard way that yeah, smells are nice, but <laughs> you know, it's a different thing. Possibly um, smoking it, you know. So yeah. Always... And then but were that... you were, were you a cigarette smoker for for very long, for many years before then? Yeah, I, I yeah, pretty much. I mean, I'd had like a couple of years off here and there actually as well. I I hadn't smoked any tobacco, like zero zero tobacco in any forms. But yeah, pretty much um lifelong cigarette smoker. Mm. It's kind of strange because um yeah, nothing from I mean, even to this day I still have not smoked any kind of tobacco in front of my father. <laughs> <laughs> really? Such an anti smoker. Yeah. My mother my mother, it doesn't matter what I smoke in front of my mother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mum. <laughs> Biggest fan. <laughs> good. No, well, that's good that you're, I mean, you're obviously living in an area where it's a lot easier to get your hands on the uh, bulk tobacco from Germany. Uh, yeah, whenever I, I showed some friends your, your, your YouTube channel and they were very impressed, very impressed with the, the making of that rope and uh, the... Uh, yeah, they would probably have a go on that kind of thing if we, we could order the tobacco. So uh, maybe I'll talk to you afterwards and see if we can get that stuff somehow. Yeah, I, can see, I certainly don't mind doing a relay, how do you say, relay posting. I mean, because the problem is here in France, I know I'm not logged into WhatsApp, do really. um, The problem here in France is that I kind of, I, in some ways, it's oxymoronic because France and Saint Claude in France has, has a huge pedigree of pipe making that goes back to from when they first started making briar pipes. Yeah, it should say briar started in France, really, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, briar pipes in France. Yeah, there's some quite high end marks. You know, some of the boots you can and the Chacon pipes are beautiful. Um, Somme pipes and um, Somme made uh, Meerschaum pipes for Dunhill during the, the, the Second World War. Right. Um, but the problem is in France is that the, the, there is no tobacco that you want to put in your pipe. Um, you've kind of got like um, caporal. It's, 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 I wouldn't like to say what it is. I mean, the, the caporal grey. They didn't even know what it is. It's a grey area of what you know what's inside the packet, um, and it's it's got something to do with um, apparently could be wrong if any uh, any French people correct me. But apparently, it's got something to do with um, national service and tobacco rations. Okay. The government wanted to keep um, complete monopoly on tobacco rations. Mm -hmm. And obliquely, somehow, this is now represents pipe tobacco because most people during the conscription years smoke pipes. Mm -hmm. So you, you can buy Marlborough, but you can't buy um, Samuel Gowith. You know, mm. it has to be French tobacco, the the the, the pipe tobacco. See, so. okay. And also on top of that, it is um, illegal to buy tobacco online. Really? Right. Yeah. So you, you can't order online for many. It's illegal. Jesus. I didn't know. Yeah, that. they, they realised that it was only like about maybe five, six years ago that like 80 percent of smokers in France were um, buying their cigarettes from Belgium because it was right, cheaper. Yeah. yeah. And so they put all these embargoes. Um, and even if it's a tobacconist in France, I cannot order online from a tobacconist in France. Right, you know, and say, so, this is why I make a lot of the Thomas Darius stuff, um, mm -hmm. the, the tax packers, because he's a small producer and he, he makes some quite adventurous tobaccos himself. Yeah, and it's very reasonably priced, yeah. and he's not so worried about these slight border issues that some of the authorities may have and so okay. yeah I, I take like maybe two or three big orders a year you know from him yeah, yeah. so you, you can sample things but just not uh, very often you're kind of forced into a position where you have to make your own tobacco then and you seem to be doing very well but 
Well, it's, it's funny. I, I, I learned the pipe in, in reverse. I learned the pipe through making my own tobacco before I discovered um, the world of tobacco, mm. in a way. And now it's interesting going back to some of these old tobaccos. And um, I, I can taste, oh, yeah, like the Kentucky. I had no time for it. It didn't taste of anything when I made it. And I, I tasted some um, yesterday. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's got quite a strong Kentucky taste that and there's some sweetness there I still get you end up with the same slime on your tongue or something is the best way to describe it and the kind of youngness of the tobacco hopefully but yeah I mean it's, it's definitely worth doing you know like 100 euros once a year and mm. fuck around uh, trying out some stuff you've seen on the internet put it in some jars excellent work check out his videos guys it's really really good stuff really enjoyable seeing how that's done and the uh, cavern dishing as well very interesting so did you say you've lost that batch of parikh then or was that an old batch that you've lost it's somewhere in my house but my house is kind of um it's being renovated so it's a bit messy yeah, and it's it's one of those, you know, you're sort of living in the same space that you're trying to renovate, so that there's um, you end up with multiple piles that are transversing other multiple piles mm -hmm. and stuff. And you need to get to that corner. Oh no, that's the scrap metal corner <laughs> that has to merge with the, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you need to build a bridge. That's <laughs> um... all good, you know. And what can I say? I mean, it, it was dirt cheap. I think it was um, a lot less than twenty thousand euros for a house. That's very cheap. For me, quiet. that area of France is renowned for being a uh, good value for money, but that is very low. That is very low, and I suppose doing a lot of the work yourself is uh, paying off as well. Yeah, I mean, because before I was living, um, I was living in uh, well, a converted Ford Transit camper van. There you for, go. Uh, since two thousand and twelve, I come in France till yeah, two thousand and seventeen. So yeah, that was five years in France, kind of um, traveling around and. Uh, it's completely luxury to have a bath or a shower then. Well, I don't know. I, have to, I, I go and visit people for those luxuries because I, I kind of haven't got around to building the bathroom yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's not really our friend. He just wants to use our shower again. <laughs> I hope no, it's old fashioned in the winter, you know, when, when the, yeah. um, I have a big uh, wood fire downstairs, like a big range. So, you know, you heat up a big thing of water and, you know, and put it into the tub and the. Uh, sit in front of the fire and have a bath like um i think many people have seen pole dark and outlander you know yeah <laughs> yeah Paul dark yeah i mean you know <laughs> <laughs> back to basics in the tub literally <laughs> that's cool uh, you know a lot of my life has been a little bit like that you know, yeah various various uh rises you know from uh road protesting and living in trees and um, working on boats in Portugal and always living in like uh, unusual places. And that's cool. That's cool. Do you have any um, any animals um, with you? Any dogs or cats with you? Um, I did. I, for many years, I had dogs. For many years. Uh, my last dog vanished here. And... Mm. Uh, I kind of thought, well, no more dogs for me. Um, but I am friend of cat now. I'm just looking for my cats. Um, yeah. Cats are okay. They, they're not so demanding as dogs, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're quite independent. I, I can go away for a couple of months if someone feeds the cats, you know. You know yeah. They live in the farm as much as they live in my house, you know. Mm. Quite wild. But before, here in France, I'm just little bit up the road i haven't done a video of there yet maybe i should do that one um when i lived in my uh, transit camping car actually i looked after about 300 pigs <laughs> and they what? all lived in the forest with like electric fences to keep them in 
Right. Um, what uh, what breed were they? Uh, what breed? Do you know the pigs? Uh, c'est le Gascon Noir. Gascon Noir. I'm not sure. Um, a big black pig. Big black. Pig. Gascon Gascon Black. It's gone black. It's, nice. it's like if you if you if you go to Paris to the best restaurant and you order pork, you would expect it to be from this breed of pig. Okay, you okay. Know, it, you know, it makes the high end um, charcuterie and the nice. They're yeah. so smart. They're so intelligent. Oh man, they are. Especially because you know they, they, these guys lived outside, mm. and it's 300 but, but not all in one group there's like 80 live in that field like 60 young ones live in you know and we're, we're talking in the forest where it's like i don't know old-fashioned one in four like um 60 percent slope you know right um, right these pigs out and all they have is a little um electric fence up to their knees to keep them in mm-hmm. and then and they're so intelligent you know and you'd have to move fields and you can train them and, and sometimes I, i'd have a bucket with um you know some pig food in but i'd be just be walking up the up um like a communal track in the forest mm-hmm. into another field and behind me there'd be like 50 60 pigs following yeah yeah the and, pipe, pipe. You know, yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah and it's magical these moments of animals you know where they're just they have a different different sense of freedom, you know. They they, they want um, they want freedom not to be hungry, you know, and freedom not to be cold. You know, they they don't give a fuck about the view, you know. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever uh, train any of them to sniff out some truffles and make you rich? No, I mean that's more down in Provence. Uh, right, right. Just, uh, yeah, better climate for them. Like, if I go for a piss here, it goes into the Atlantic. If about a two hour drive the other way. If I go for a piss, it goes into the Mediterranean. France right, right. is like the Mediterranean. It's yeah. sort of like a, a horseshoe kind of ridge here, I guess. And, how, and, how, and it's interesting. Did you know? Did you know this truffle thing? Yeah. When when a pig or a dog finds the truffle, there's a hormone in the truffle. That creates a permanent memory in the animal that finds it. Really? Where the animal found it, yeah. Because they the truffle relies on it being dug up to spread the spores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a hormone in in, in mushroom that. uh, That's insane. That's. Oh, fucking it. The world of mushrooms. (laughs) That's insane. magic or otherwise well otherwise around here because you know we're suffering from um ash die back all of the ash trees are kind of dying back um i'm not i'm not an expert on this but apparently it's something to do with another beetle that brings in a more dominant um mycelium network a more dominant fungus Mm -hmm. and the tree can't, can't every tree has its own mycelium its own fungus and they have the symbiotic kind of relationship between the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fascinating stuff. The mycology. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> how how far above sea level are you? Where I am sitting now is probably almost exactly nine hundred meters. Okay. Okay. Um, if I go up the roads like ten minutes on foot, I can be at like one thousand one hundred meters. Okay. You know. That's a real yeah, a gradient, thing. yeah. That's quite a gradient. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's quite uh the roads you know, follow all the windy stuff, but you know in the snow it's great. You can go mm. from you know, Toboggan. Yeah, I mean yeah. You gotta be fucking it's, it's dangerous shit, man. So dangerous in the snow. Too steep. Too steep. Um, one time I ended up um, upside down in a Land Rover in a river. <clears throat> Fuck. <laughs> Hi. What happened? Because um, the steering broke. And the, the roads here are so treacherous. You know, you're, you're, like, you're following, um, it's like Lord of the Rings. You know, you're, you're following a precipice. Yeah. And yeah, the steering broke. And, you know, it was in a 
a split second, the steering wheel turned 90 degrees. The front wheels went like this, and I fell about eight meters down. Boom, in the Land Rover, and then it flipped upside down in all the water. Yeah. I'm sure that was pretty traumatizing. Did you get out? You uh, got out, okay? Yeah, I got out, and I got my... um. The day before, I'd been to Toulouse and bought, spent loads of money on some speakers and stuff like this for my studio. Um, and this is this is all upside down in the river. And I managed to get it all to safety and managed to climb this like five, six meter kind of cliff, like Terrace mm -hmm. Cliff, all my stuff on the side of the road. And then one of my neighbours drives past and takes me home. About an hour later, you just realised, man, you know, actually, I'd, I'd broken all of my ribs from the um, seat belt, and, uh, you know, and yeah, my shoulder, my shoulder's still pretty fucked now. But in in that moment of adrenaline, I managed yeah, to rescue my speakers and kind of climb this cliff, and uh, you know, so. that's good. The, the speakers remain dry somehow. Somebody was looking out for you. Extreme sports. Yeah. But no, it's, it's a nice place to live, you know, in the winter, is you have to be careful. But the, the, the beauty is here, in um, the nearest town is called Masat, and there's like three valleys. Mm -hmm. um, and people have lived here for tens of thousands of years. Okay. Um, and it's only like a very small village of like maybe four or five hundred people who live there. But it has its own bakery, its own butchery, its own fruit and veg shop. Um, if you chose to, you could actually live solely off the produce Mid, of the yeah. three valleys where you lived. Okay. If you could afford to, you know, because obviously um, real food is a bit more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's why it's a special place to live because when um, I mean, you have lots of producers in the real sense of producing um, food. Um, there's lots of producers here in the sense of music and artists also. It's kind of quite a, dare I say, bohemian liberal kind of um, general vibe to the, to the area. That's cool. The people are nice. That's cool. It's always very special thing as well, being able to eat food that is grown all around you, you know, and the, all the produce is in and around you it's good for you it's better for you that way you can't be your own veg garden and it's so easy to do some stuff it's like um things like leeks are so easy to grow yeah you so can expensive. Yeah, and yeah. they just sit there all winter and when you want one you go outdoors and pull one up and yeah. they taste pretty much better than uh you know one that you picked yesterday even you know, that, that fresh thing of um you know, getting a vegetable yeah, not like like uh, the stuff you get in supermarkets in uh, Britain, you know, that's been frozen for six months and yeah, well, a month, you know. That's cool. Good it's to have. Tricky one, you know. I mean, there's there's this... many of my friends are kind of what some people would call like alternative or something you know maybe they're vegan or whatever and i i kind of sort of think that it's it's not the right discussion to have like the discussion meat versus vegetables it's not really it doesn't really go anywhere and what we have to look at is um farming practices um like round here like you can't grow grain around here it's too steep you know you can't get the machinery in to harvest it so oh, yeah. well, you harvest sheep you know you mm -hmm. grow sheep sheep are great you know they have wool and stuff you know yeah and yeah. the problem is now like especially where my friend lives in Shropshire he calls it operation golf course so they just you know keep taking out more hedgerows keep growing one thing and one thing and it's all contractors rather than um, a farmer Right. Okay. Because 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 one you know one farmer grows cows, one farmer grows carrots. But like a hundred years ago, and for the last many tens of thousands of years, the farmer would have cows, chickens, carrots, onions, cabbages. You know, you name it, and it, it's self sufficient like this. You know, yeah. But modern yeah. farming moves so far away from that model. It's it's, it's um. 
it. It's creating this dichotomy of uh, vegetarianism or meat eaters, veganism to save the planet. Yeah. Well, possibly, you know, but when the oil runs out, we're kind of going to need um, um, the wool of the sheep to make our jumpers again, yeah. you know? So we're, we're going to always have this relationship with animals. Yeah. Plus the, the, the whole argument that um, you need a lot of land as well to plant all the soy and all the, the different crops you need for the vegan diet as well. So you can save the planet by not eating meat. It's just, a, you know, we're not going to see I think it. it depends where you live. It depends where you live. Like, um, yeah, yeah. like this, this part of you in the winter. Yeah, man, you know, it's the same. You know, I, 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 I was in Slovakia for some time. It's really cold. You need some hardcore animal fats when it's like minus 20 something outside, you know. But mm -hmm. when I stayed in um, Sri Lanka and you, you know, you're close to the equator, man, you can live on like banana smoothies, you know, because the climate's yeah. different. And so, yeah, you know, it's really easy to be a vegan living in Hawaii, but yeah, it's quite hard to be um, a Viking vegan, yeah, you know. That's mad. Then you you really have been everywhere. Then did you spend time in? I have been everywhere. This is this is the shock. Like uh, yeah, I've been to lots of places, but not many places. Mm. More than not, not really on holiday. Like like I decided to go to Portugal to see my mum, and ended up staying there for three years, working on um, an old sailing boat, taking tourists out to sea, just because. I can sail and I know my knots and chatting to some guy in a bar and he gave me a job, you know, it was ended up living with the fishermen gypsies of the Algarve in Portugal. Yeah. That's cool. Can't get up, man. People say you should write your memoirs and I'm like, Oh yeah, but it's all like really boring, nothing's really happened, but like nothing's really happened in like loads of different places, you know. Mm. Everyone thinks their own story is boring, though. I mean, you, yeah, you should definitely re write a book. Think about writing a book or something. It's when like you, you know, when, when I sat there in India, and it's really chaotic in front of you. But when you when, when you sort of chill out and look at what's really going on, well, there's some guy pushing some watermelons up the street slowly. Uh, there's some old lady walking down the street slowly. And there's loads of people doing loads of stuff really slowly, but in front of you, it just looks like chaos, you know, mm. it's just like full on like India. Just busy. Yeah. But when you look into the busyness, well, no, no one's in a rush, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, just... the more laid back lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, it is busy. And this is one thing I'd love to do with a um, YouTube channel, really, actually, is to do more travel stuff. Um, I follow a couple of YouTubers that uh, just just do the whole shaky cam point of view travel journal kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it's great. And I, I'd really like to do that when the borders open up, like, you know, me trying to find trying to find um, a, a pipe tobacco shop in Mumbai or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. That would be Crazy good. Crazy travel videos for pipe tobacco, you know what I mean? <laughs> travel the globe with Simon. <laughs> Um, tell me this, and how's the uh, your Etsy shop, folks? I will leave a link to Simon's Etsy store. Uh, very interesting. I like the uh, t-shirts; are great, great designs for pipe smoking t-shirts. And you have a good, very good selection of estate pipes. What kind of things have you got in at the moment, or how long has the Etsy been going? And tell me a bit about it. I started my Etsy shop in the middle of December, like just before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, because I had loads of pipes around. Mm -hmm. thought, well, actually, if you polish them up, they're okay, you know? Yeah. Uh, being on various Facebook groups, people seemed... Um, especially new, new pipe makers. It's like, well, you know, I'm scared to buy a pipe off eBay. But I don't want to go and spend like a hundred euros. And I'm like, 
Well, okay, well, you know, I've got some okay pipes here, you know, and it's the same price as the 20, 30 euro pipes you'll get off eBay. But they're going to be okay, you know. Yeah. You know, check it out. Um, and it started a bit like that. And I had loads of sales, actually. Um, and, yeah, it's one of them, you know. It's kind of uh, quite phenomenal how, it, you know, I was thinking, yeah, uh, maybe so one or two here and there but actually it's almost become well it has become my full-time income source as in that is the only money coming in <laughs> right right but it's going no no, I, I, no it, it is phenomenal actually yeah it's kind of um it's a great platform etsy for people to sell stuff on yeah as an audience yeah yeah, yeah. What way does it work with Etsy? Do you have to pay them a monthly fee or do they take a cut of every sale that you make or what happens? It's something like 20 cents for every listing. Is that all? Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's for like four months or something. It's kind of for a long time. Um, if you make a sale, they, I think they take like three or four percent of the sale. And they do all of the um, all of the um, um, payment processing also. Okay. Yeah. And then it's like so it works out about ten percent for, for Etsy in the payment processing. And of course, your page is translated into every single language. So if somebody from Germany is looking, it's translated to German. Mm. I've, tried, I've tried running my own website before, and when you start getting into the language stuff. Yeah, you know, I don't want to spend my time running a website. But no, Ed, Etsy's great. You know, it's, it's a really good platform. That sounds quite reasonable. And like you say, it's they manage the website for you. You you design it or within the parameters of Etsy design, I suppose, and then they look after it for you. Yeah, and then, you know, it, it, it's kind of amazing. You know, I thought oh, I just just set it up as a side thing. You know. Like actually, yeah, all of, it's becoming one of those things now. It's like shit. I need to get some more pipes, you know, mm -hmm. kind of sell it, and uh, you know, it's kind of growing. And uh, but hopefully, I'm hoping um, to get uh, some more of these um, Scandinavian freehand ones. Um, okay. There's still some blank stumbles available from from this abandoned workshop in um, Denmark, and they've been. They were cut about 30, 40 years ago, and you know, the, the, the typical plateau kind of Danish free hands. Hoping to get some more of them, and maybe pay somebody to make some fancy stumbles, um, some fancy stems, sorry. Yeah. So, but a stem maker's name to the pipes. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're phenomenal. I mean, all mine are downstairs at the moment. I have one. So, okay. yeah. You know, it could be a collaboration then with somebody. Somebody who's making it It's just that kind of thing of like, uh, you know, there's not much work around here. So I, you know, I spend my days doing what I can do. And what I can do is um, go through this box of pipes and stand them up. And it's starting to, you know, like I say, it's starting to... Um, Go somewhere a little bit, and I'm like, well, why not? And hold on, no, I do have one. I tell her right. Tell her right. But you know, yeah, this this fill on sort of Gandalf sort of like a style pickaxe. Yeah, my mate calls it um, a sheep's gonad. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a yeah, bunch of available in kind of shape, and the, you know the, the, they're amazing pipes. Yeah, because they're so old. Yeah, the briar's really dry, you know, mm -hmm. really well seasoned. And they're like, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Hopefully, I'm going to get a few more of them. I think rather than some more cheap French pipes. Well, that's good. It's good. I'm glad everything's going as it should uh, in the short space of time that it's been operating. Do you shift many of the T-shirts as well then? No, I, that's, that's just a new thing, really. Um, I, I, I mostly, to be honest, it, I think 
with Etsy, you have to have, if you have more than 20 things in your shop, the algorithm, the search algorithm does you some favors. Right. And so if the, the pipe stock goes down, yeah, put a t shirt in or something. But, yeah, okay. To, to the keep t shirt. Yeah. Playing around in my spare time, learning, you know, Adobe Illustrator. Oh, well, why not, you know? I've got a, you know, I wear them myself and uh, put them on the shop. And, uh, they'll be cheeky. They look, they look cool, man. I think they're cool. Do you make them yourself then? Do you have a t-shirt printer and everything? Or do you... So it's no, like it's, you design them and then... It's a design. company that, that, that kind of... If somebody orders it, basically, mm -hmm. um, it just goes to another company and they already have the digital files. They print the t-shirt. And mm. then they ship it to the customer, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, loads of famous brands use this company, you know. It's kind of like, a, it's just how fashion shirts, I won't say Nike and Reebok, but, you know, that's yeah. a different thing. A lot of stuff. It's like, yeah, it's printed on demand and it's kind of good in a way because there's no wastage. That's, yeah, I was going to say that, yeah. Yeah, no wastage. Like, Maybe I need a thousand sizes of medium and you only sell 400. Yeah. You know? No, that's it. great. Made, made to order and, and anything uh, goes wrong, it means that, you know, you, you're not liable for things that if they go wrong, I guess. If they send I out. And people and sort it out. But yeah, I mean, it just, it just means that, you know, you can sell some designs and you don't need to have like, you know, a thousand t-shirts in boxes under your feet you know it, it, another company has a digital file they print it and send it out you know and they, they you know they're doing millions of orders a day you know this this is their business model you know yeah yeah it works all right you know that's great i tried man. it before doing doing a t-shirt business and i made loads of cool designs but then i couldn't get anybody really to go to my website and buy a t-shirt <laughs> so because it's like a million people doing this stuff in there you know? yeah 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 but it's good it's good that you find your niche now with the the pipe man or the pipe estate fixing up estates and t-shirts to go along with that it, it's really good it's a good mix and the t-shirts the look really cool Quite enjoyable, you know? getting these old pipes and bringing them back to life mm -hmm. you think oh that's a bit of a dog and then you know you get to the bottom of it and it becomes your favorite um you know New, you know, new surprises every day. Um, let me see. You had mentioned to me a, a good idea, an idea of yours that uh, you thought you we could or you would share with the the YTPC. Maybe organize some sort of function whenever COVID fucks off for good. Oh, right, yeah, at the um, at the chateau. Um, Mm -hmm. Fucking hell, man. Yeah, that, that'd be awesome. Um, so it's a local. I won't, I, I won't give away the name, um, but basically, no. yeah. uh, I have some friends who are Dutch ex activist squatters, I guess. Mm -hmm. they, they, they've been running um, a chateau for like maybe 10 years now and they're like the caretaker and okay. um, the owner of the chateau is um he's a, a dutch plastic surgeon or something that does reconstructive surgery after facial burns and things so okay. uh, and, and this place is awesome you know um and it made its money by um harvesting tobacco growing and planting and harvesting tobacco and there's loads of old machinery well bits of old machinery there and the chateau sleeps 26. There's outbuildings that sleep another whatever. And out of season, it's, it's only like sort of 2,000, 2,500 a week. So yeah. we're like 30 odd pipe smokers, you know, sort of bunk up. And, uh, and it's quite liberal, as in, there's no problem to smoke indoors. Mm -hmm. This is why I didn't give the company name away. Uh, yeah, yeah, Simon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you see this stuff. <laughs> but no, no you know, well, basically, you know, when my mates do the cleaning, they might set up a green screen for their own video projects, and let's say they're 
um, they're from Holland, so they have liberal views regarding um, smoking indoors. Yeah, perfect. That's great. Um, imagine that, 30 YTPC members meeting up in, the, in France for a little, a long weekend. And... Put it in context, it's about, if you have to drive it, it's, it's, it's about an hour north of Toulouse, which is where the nearest airport is. So ah. by train, public transport, you know, it's like an hour north of the nearest airport, you know, it's kind of quite easy. But yeah, it, it'd be kind of quite cool, you know, maybe um, get some, uh, need to get a superstar there, you need like Bremen pipe smoker to come and yeah. uh, do an hour's talk or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a good idea. I'll try, I'll try reaching out to him if you want. We will maybe wait until COVID is lifting. It's kind of how I discovered the um, YPTC actually is through the uh, Bremen pipe smaker. Before I, I had any idea this stuff sort of existed. Yeah. I stumbled this channel. And yeah. Kind of like just binge watch, binge watch the whole thing, you know, and I'm like, yeah, he's quite a character, you know, he sort of knows is his it, stuff. Mark he's, he's not, um, I mean, you know, it's like in France, you have all these wine snobs. Well, it's Nissy person, put it in it's a Nissy person, you know. It's a bit of this, of the pipe smoking, tasting. Oh, okay. It's a bit more, um, you know, doesn't pontify, what's the word? Um, <laughs> He's not pompous. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I love him. I love him. Whenever I first saw his video, I, of one of his videos, I thought he was from New York. It's like, you know the way he speaks. It's very strange. But that lower Saxony that, accent. There is an interesting connection, actually. Um, and funnily enough, it comes back to the Rat Trace Marlin Flakes. Um, because the video he did of Rat Trace Marlin Flakes was at the Merovingian graveyard somewhere up in the north of Germany. And the okay. Merovingian, this, this, this big... Um, that's kind of what Game of Thrones were based upon. Like, there's this big nasty family that just, like, fucked each other and killed each other to stay in power. Um, <laughs> and the next valley from mine, the Valley of Sex, spelled with, um, yeah, there's, a, there's an old um, ruined Merovingian um, temple and palace there. And, and I'm just trying to get a bit more of the history to do a join up with, um, yeah. The Rattray's Marlin Flake at the Merovingian site, done by Bremen Pipe Smoker, to the Rattray's Marlin Flake at the Merovingian burial place in the valley next to mine. Oh, yeah. 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 I'll put some yeah. content videos, you know. It's really easy to make a boring video, isn't it? But to go and actually make some content involves effort and mm -hmm. time to that's kind of yeah mark's great at that he's great he knows his things uh, when it comes to history as well his videos are very interesting i think he's um i think he's a if i correct me if i'm wrong he's i think he's a professor of medieval warfare really i think is his niche i, I knew he, i knew he was a lecturer and i sus had a suspicion it was to do with history but i didn't know that the, the specific channel that I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, <laughs> what you know? I, th I think you know. He has one of those channels you can watch it whether you're a pipe smoker or not a pipe smoker because often yeah. the subject matter and the content is, is like really valuable and interesting. Yeah, and he comes um, a really good standpoint of just being a very neutral narrator. You know, when it comes to um, sins of Germany's past and uh, yeah, you know, he's a very um, yeah. he's yeah. great he's great we uh we might have a hard time getting him to i'll try getting in touch with him when the time comes he's he's i think he's, I, I think i think he's in a different league you know because he, he gets like two thousand views of video i mean mutton chop pipe he gets like twenty thousand or something but mm -hmm. i don't know do do the uh the youtube gods come down to the uh yeah, lights at the bottom. The we can, stuff. we can certainly try. We can certainly try. He was, uh, he was on the, the virtual pipe club not so long ago. Uh, so that's interesting if you haven't watched it yet. Um, but I'm sure the, the other 
prefer to play club with the blender of um Cornell and Deer, I forget his name off the top of my head. That's another great one. Uh, Jeremy Blender, Cornell and Deal, guy of the beard. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's grown his hair long recently. Uh with a guy with the glasses and the or am I thinking of someone else? Uh, I'm thinking... Another great uh, meeting, actually, the Virtual Fight Club. I've, I've dipped into a couple of them, but I've always been too shy to speak because all oh, this Zoom and I get confused. You know, I have one computer doing run thing that, that runs a music studio and then a phone that does the internet and a tablet that does the social media. and They don't all have the same things installed, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I kind of like like that you know, uh, keeps it separate yeah one one thing for one purpose hmm. well that would be great to arrange i'll certainly try and help you as much as i can to arrange that and make it happen and uh if we need to come up with a pool of money to entice mark bremen piper to give a an hour long Discussion. Yeah, and it's I, I've spoken to Mikhail, my friend there, and he's like, oh man, that'd be amazing. And there's like an outdoor swimming pool, and you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it is a thing. Um, what isn't a thing is that you're not going to get any pipe tobacco from the local tobacconists. Yeah, but we'd be allowed to bring. It's okay to bring some, yeah. Well, or you, or you do something like if like 30 people were going to turn up. Everybody is going to turn up and make some mystery package mm -hmm. of, like, you know, just say like a hundred grams of samples or whatever, and everybody pastes it there. Yeah. Before everybody turns up, so straight yeah. away there's a big kind of a mystery bag of samples for people to um, dip into, and people can bring their favourites. So there'd be loads of tobacco there. Yeah. But yeah, no, that, that'd be interesting. Be My Dutch friend dropped drop the green screen and mm. sooner or later do the video editing so it looks like we're in, uh, you know, some cocktail lounge in <laughs> Manhattan, Manhattan or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that sounds cool. That sounds cool. We'll definitely do that. Well, look, I'll round it up here. Um, final question, then I'll just ask you about. What do you think is the future of pipe smoking? Do you think it's, you know, the likes of YouTube, they're going to, to to ban all tobacco related things or what? what's happening, do you think? I, I don't think they can if you click the um, not suitable for kids because yeah. there's loads of niche content on YouTube. Um, I said before this weird thing where what was it getting firewood of Kentucky bird got loads of views. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah all this weird adult content on YouTube. Um, yeah. So there's always going to be weird, weird adult content on YouTube, I think. So I'm, I'm not so worried about that. Uh, in general, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's going to ban tobacco anytime soon. Um, you know, I don't know. How many kilos do I need for the next 30 years? Yeah. There, there will, there'll be a black market anyway. There'll be a black market. If it well, does. When, I, when I was learning how to do my tobacco processing and, and, and like sort of going deep, you know, really old YouTube stuff, there's this really cool hill, hillbilly dude, and I can't remember his name. And he didn't even smoke tobacco. But he was growing it and doing all of this processing. And he went, the reason I'm doing it is because if and when anything goes wrong or anything collapses, Tobacco is going to be worth as much as gold and silver as a currency, as a bartering yeah. currency. Yeah, yeah. He's a bit more of a prepper, survivalist. Yeah. And he yeah. was just growing, pressing, growing and pressing, you know, sorting out his cash, you know, on the back of a four-wheel drive Unimog in case the zombie apocalypse happens. You know, he's got loads of tobacco to trade with. That's a really good idea. Yeah, maybe yeah, we start yeah, yeah. doing that. I hadn't really kind of taking it to that extreme but I was like well yeah you know it's kind of true isn't it you know in, in terms of uh, 
I've been in many real life situations where your money's no good. You know, what have you got? I've got some fags. Well, that'll do. Yeah. It's kind of uh, how it works. You know, it's a, it's a bartering commodity. You know? We're going to have to prepare in some shape or form before the economy collapses for good then. <laughs> I, I kind of sort of think part of me kind of doesn't really want it to happen because, uh, you know, it'll burst my comfort bubble and life will become tough. And the other part of me wants it to happen because I've spent my whole life getting all of these skills of, you know, how to farm land, how to um, prepare meat, how to weave fabric, you know, how to sail boats, how to fix engines, all of this. Prepper and it, uh, stuff. One part of me is like, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of like to have a lifetime test. Maybe be the old guy in the movie, you know? Yeah, yeah. Not Jurassic Park, but be, be like the 80-year-old guy that's going to get eaten first. But. You know, <laughs> Yeah. teaches everybody else how to light the fire and uh, you know, how to make a jumper out of a rabbit and you know, <laughs> eat that yeah. cheese or whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, great. Well, well, listen, Simon, I'll end the recording here. We can continue talking afterwards. I'd like to keep these, you know, an hour and a half. So thank you very much for joining. And well, thanks uh, everyone for watching as well. I hope you ramble on to no, absolutely not. not. It's really hard. I have this, uh, I have this kind of light here, and um, so everyone can see me. And it's just been in my eyes for the last uh, <laughs> how long? <laughs> I'm really well, looking forward good. to putting the light on the other side of my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks very much indeed. And uh, check out his much. channel, folks, and check out his uh, Etsy and his channel. I'll leave links below. Thanks for joining me. Cheers.